joined the Royal Navy uh, in 1960 and I specialised in microwave warfare. Uh, radar, obviously, which uses microwave, but they don't just teach you radar, they teach you all about microwaves and other uses. So I understood about microwave warfare and how it can damage people, how it can harm people. Uh, and when I finished with the Royal Navy, uh, I was also a diver in the Royal Navy. Um, and microwaves are used in underwater mines as uh, booby traps. Uh, you can, which actually got me interested because I, I was actually taking a bomb to pieces underwater and it was too complicated. Uh, and I brought it to the surface and my partner that was on the surface said, don't be an idiot, take it back down. He said, if somebody's beaming you with microwaves, they'll go right through you and as you open the casing, trigger a photoelectric cell and it'll blow ever, all of us up. And, they, and he said, if it doesn't go through to the bomb, it'll aim it at your head and make you make a mistake. And that's really got me interested from that point because I thought, well, how can microwaves going into your brain make you make a mistake? Um, and I, I asked a lot of questions. I have a very curious brain. And the forces, they're very good at explaining things and telling you things. Uh, so I did that and, and I, I also did a medical course while I was in to help me understand everything. And when I left, uh, a small part of my job was to question captured agents, spies, terrorists, because microwaves then were used as weapons, as they are today. It is a, a perfect stealth weapon. And when governments don't like a group of people, for instance, the, the ladies who protest at Greenham Common in England about the American missile base, they camped, they were microwaved. We microwaved Catholics in Northern Ireland to make them sick. Uh, it, it goes on all over the world. And it, it's a weapon that you don't know you're being targeted because the dose is very, very low, which is actually more dangerous than a high dose. It's very, very low, and it may take a year or two, but you can, you can cause neurological damage and cancers with low-level microwaves. And you can make all your opponents sick. It, it's a perfect weapon for a government uh, to use. So, that was going on, and, and I gathered all the information about that from people who were captured from other countries uh, to find out what technologies they had, what pulse frequencies they used. But as I stressed, it was only a small part of my work, but because I was highly trained in it and I was useful, uh, it, it just became a part of my working structure, along with master criminals and terrorists and all sorts of people that I found incredibly interesting actually to talk to. Very, very interesting. And then when I left there, uh, I, I, I took a job teaching and I taught advanced level physics and I specialised in nuclear and atomic radiation and again microwaves. <clears throat> and it, I've just always been in microwaves and then it was a doctor uh, I, I went to see a doctor once, as most teachers do, uh, with a, a sore throat. And he, he said, as most doctors do, it's viral, there's nothing I can do for you. And, and I was leaving, and he said, hang on, Barry, he said. Uh, he said, you're a physicist. And I said, yeah. And he said, can you explain something? He said, I went to a house that had a cot death five years ago. And the family moved, and a new family moved in. They had a new baby. The cot was in exactly the same place, and there was another cot death. And he said, five years apart. And he said, there's a transmitter the other side of the child's bedroom wall. Could the transmitter cause the cot death? And I said, I don't know. I said, but I'll look into it. And then I found that microwaves were involved 
and I knew what microwaves did. And a while later, I went back to the doctor, I wrote a paper on it, and I said, there's your answer. Microwaves can cause cot death by two or three different mechanisms. Um, there's your answer. Um, and then, uh, for some reason, he told somebody who told somebody, and people started phoning me up and writing to me, saying, can you explain this or can you help with that? Uh, I've never actually asked anyone if I can do anything. They always come to me. And then the police came to me and said, we're getting this new Tetra airwave system, we don't understand uh, what's happening. Can you read all this scientific rubbish and just put it into Janet and John and tell us? And I said, of course I can. Uh, so that was published and, and since then it, it, it's, it, it's snowballed and snowballed and snowballed and now I receive up to a thousand communiques a week from various countries, various people, and uh, I, I can't handle it. So, uh, and I'm, I'm here now because somebody asked me to come here. Wi-Fi, I think anyone who puts Wi-Fi into a school should be locked up for the rest of their life. I really do. I think they're not fit to walk on the surface of this planet because they haven't looked at the research and whatever incentive they have, it is not worth the genetic problems that parents are going to face with their children when they're born. And if you think of a single parent, a mother, who has a genetically deformed child, that that particular mother, mother will feel guilty because she gave birth. She will feel guilty and she will be worried every single second of every single day for her life. She will worry that the child won't marry. If the child can marry, she'll worry that the children will carry the disease, which they will. She will worry when she dies who will take care of them. So you are condemning both the family and the children uh, to a lifetime of absolute hell. <clears throat> And this is already published, it is available to look up. It's what I call intentional ignorance. They are offered some sort of incentive and they think, oh, this is going to be good, we'll have it. Now the problem is, imagine you are a 15-year-old schoolgirl. All of the 400,000 eggs in your ovaries were with you at birth. They're not fully developed, but they're with you. They are 10 times more susceptible to radiation than all of the other DNA in the body. And scientists don't realize that. They don't read all of the papers as I do. So you have this highly susceptible genetic material which is going to make your children and you are irradiating it because Wi-Fi's they are transmitters as well as the routers as well as the ones either side of you they are all transmitting at this height through your ovaries <clears throat> so you are risking the damage the DNA damage of your child every time you sit down and you use Wi-Fi and it's like saying, if I smoke a cigarette, which one will cause the damage? The answer is, I don't know. It could be the one today. <clears throat> so, you now have a child that has a probability of being genetically damaged. But the real damage is when that child grows up you have genetic material in your ovaries which could be damaged. Now, the real problem comes... So you, you have a child that could be born genetically damaged. But the real problem comes when you become pregnant. If you are a teacher or a mature student and you become pregnant. 
because the embryo inside your womb, in the first 100 days, all of those 400,000 eggs are forming in your embryo, your child's ovaries. <clears throat> so your child could be born with genetically damaged eggs. And the main thing about the eggs in the ovaries of your child is that they have absolutely no protection. It, it hasn't been developed yet. We have a natural protection against microwaves. It was developed since the Stone Age against thunderstorms and massive amounts of radiation coming into our body. But in the, your embryo, your uterus, in the fetus, uh, where your child is developing for the first 100 days, in the ovaries, the eggs do not have that protection. So they are at maximum risk from radiation. And for the first month or so, you wouldn't even know you were pregnant. You wouldn't even be taking precautions. That is the main danger area. So you give birth to a daughter, but her ovaries are now contaminated. She may be normal, she may be genetically damaged, but her ovaries are at the most risk. So when your daughter grows up and she becomes pregnant and has a baby, this is where one of these eggs will be fertilized and come out. So the real damage here is your grandchildren. That is where it is going to show most. And we already see this in animals that have reproductive cycles of a year or two years or three years. We're already seeing this and it has been published by veterinary schools and vets and scientists. So we know this happens. And it's also been documented uh, in the Cold War when women were deliberately microwaved. So we know it does happen. The documents are there. <clears throat> and what you're risking by putting Wi-Fi into schools is the future generations of all of these girls. But it gets worse because this particular DNA, the mitochondrial DNA inside you, and the DNA inside you, the mitochondrial DNA, you can trace unchanged to your mother, her mother, her mother, right the way back to the beginning of the human race in Africa, the Stone Age. You can trace your ancestors, if you could, right back to the very first lady. It is unchanged, the mitochondria. And that is being unchanged in your children, which means if you damage it, your child could be genetically damaged, then her child, and her child, and her child, forever. You are condemning the future generations of every single child until there are no more lines left in the female in your family. You, you must stop. Some, a female must stop producing children for this to stop. <clears throat> so it, when you put Wi-Fi in schools, what you're saying is, for the sake of a little bit of money that saves getting a workman in to drill holes through the walls to, to feed cable because it's cheaper, we're just going to put Wi-Fi in, but you can have genetically damaged children for the rest of your family's career. That's what we're saying.